Today, we are resuming our study in the, priv- in the uh, book of Revelation as we trek through. We last were in uh, chapter 18 in, back in early July or mid-July. And so, uh, if you were here then, you might remember, or if you've read it recently, you might remember that God showed us there a, a drastic judgment upon that he has and will bring upon a culture, a world system in outright rebellion against him. In chapter 17, we saw God depict this world system as a prostitute that in every generation seeks to create a counterfeit God, uh, I'm sorry, a counterfeit city of God on the earth. And symbolically, the Lord calls that culture, that counterfeit city, Babylon, And Babylon represents, as Janice Johnson comments, a culture of people that is intoxicated by the idolatrous adoration of pleasure and possessions. Because that's an apt description of our culture, I want to read it again. Babylon, in Revelation, represents a culture of people that is intoxicated by the idolatrous adoration of pleasure and and possessions. It's a culture built on the love of self, if you get right down to the root of it, because it's all about self-esteem, self-gratification, self-actualization. And it's a culture that continually seeks well-being and happiness horizontally, in other words, in created things, and particularly in luxury and sexual immorality, not realizing that the peace, love, and joy that their soul was designed to inhabit and live out of can only be found vertically in the adhesive love of God and his faithfulness. So their, their culture, a whole culture, and honestly it's, it's the culture in which we live, that is continually looking around them horizontally in cars and, and nature and other people and, and self adulation and exaltation for what can only be found in the infinite and good love of God in Christ Jesus. So chapter 17 goes on to portray this prostitute. She's called a prostitute because God has designed his redeemed people to be wedded to Christ. We're going to talk about that this morning. And she is a whore that allures God's people away from their devotion and and, uh loyalty to Jesus to go after the things that their flesh wants to chase. And so he goes on to portray this prostitute as riding on a grotesque beast. You may remember that. This beast was ugly in every dimension, and it represents the Antichrist. In other passages, that's how he is labeled. He is the supreme incarnation of evil on the earth. And so just as Jesus Christ is the incarnation of holiness he is God in human flesh the antichrist is the incarnation of every demonic evil embodied in a man and so we learned that this wicked substitute for Christ is proclaimed across the globe by a false prophet and so you've got this evil triad just like we have the holy triad of father son and holy spirit this evil triad of the beast and the the prostitute and the false prophet all against jesus and his mission in the world and so in revelation 18 god declared her doom and her chief crime was that she hated and murdered those who follow and obey Jesus. And so for those, reckon, those reasons, God continually, and is still calling today, instead of gradually becoming like the culture, and instead of gradually kind of absorbing their values as your own, to come out of her, lest you take part in her judgment. Because God promises to pay her back double for her sins, to give her an eternal measure of tor- torment and mourning. He will lay waste the great wealth and power in which she trusts. All this is from chapter 18. And she will be thrown down with violence and scorched with fire. The smoke from her will go up forever and ever. Picture Sodom and Gomorrah 
as, as God's people were, were called out of her and the, they turned, they, they, as they looked back, they could see the smoke from her going up. God had scorched her evil. That's what God says is going to happen to Babylon. At various points in church history, and particularly in certain regions of the world, this intense spiritual war between Babylon and and Jesus and his people can sometimes be discouraging. It, It almost feels like evil is winning. You ever feel that way? I I believe the Apostle John probably felt some degree of that loss, if you will, as he sat on the Isle of Patmos in exile for his Christian faith. But God wants to show us today that on the heels of his declaration of Babylon's doom, he chose to show John a video clip. And that's what these these cycles in Revelation are. They're, They're not in chronological order. They are video clips or slideshows, if you will, snapshots of various periods in God's redemptive history. We looked already back in chapter 7 at this final day of the Lord that we're going to look at in, in the first half of Revelation 19. And God, in his wisdom, puts it right on the heels of all this doom that he has declared for wicked Babylon. And so in chapter 19... He shows us that the Lord's people and, and all the elect angels and the elders and the host of heaven, their reaction to Babylon's demise. It's a preview of the jubilation which all who serve Jesus will experience the day when God's patience uh, with unrepentant sinners has expired. And he comes to reign over his bride, the church. The day when all Christ's enemies will have been put under his feet. And the celebration both in heaven and on earth will be nothing short of triumphant. And so that's the title of the message this morning. Triumphant worship. I think it's safe to say that we all love victory celebrations. Think back, if you will, to the last time you rejoiced with others in response to a win. Maybe it was after a... Uh, your sport, favorite sports team defeated their rival. Maybe it was a political victory. Maybe it was this morning as you saw a daughter of the Most High God profess that she was no longer in sin, but God had redeemed her and she wanted to walk in newness of life with us as her church family. All of those celebrations pale in comparison to the loud. Don't miss that this morning in our text. This is loud unrestrained exaltation which God reveals in this passage of scripture so that he's doing this and this is the 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 application this is what we God wants you to take away from this he's doing it so that as we read of this coming jubilation of heaven and earth that we can now by faith join in their praise That by faith in the veracity and the truth of this coming reality, that we can now enjoy the victory ahead of time. Follow with me as I read from God's word, Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. After this, John says, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. 
It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is omnipotent in power because it is your word. It is living and active. And we pray that your scalpel would do your work this morning in our hearts. Lord, and give us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us the same spirit of rejoicing that we who believe will experience on the last day. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, after we complete our study of Revelation, we'll begin an exposition of Genesis. And there we will be reminded that the whole purpose of creation, if you, you're here this morning, you're wondering what life is about, what does is, what is all this mean? The whole purpose of creation is singular. It is to bring God glory. Man was created in the image of God and, and given the ability to have language and articulate for one main reason, and that is to verbally give credit to God, to give praise to God for his wonderful works. Sin frustrates that whole design. Sin not only results in the curse of death and destruction rightly being pronounced upon us for our disobedience to God's law, but sinners and we're guilty of this, intentionally rob God of glory and seek to bestow it on created things, namely ourselves. Thankfully, in God's wisdom, he knew we would do that. And so he determined in the fullness of time to reveal the depth of his goodness and redemptive love in sending us a new Adam, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, a man who would be born in innocence but live out the law of God perfectly by faith, trusting in the Lord with all of his heart, overcoming every temptation. We see him tempted in the, not only in the garden but all through his, his adult life and yet without sin. And he was obedient all the way to being offered up to pay the death penalty our sin deserves on the cross. And then God raised him from the dead so that you who believe can be counted as righteous. You who believe can be justified through the resurrection of the dead, through believing that Jesus lived the life that you cannot live and believing that he paid the death penalty your sin deserves and believing that because that death penalty was paid in full, God raised him from the dead. That's what baptism depicts. Jenna has been raised with Christ by faith, just as you who believe have as well. And so what that means is your sin, no matter how heinous, stop comparing yourself to others. Your sin before God, even a little bit, is heinous. He can't stand it. But no matter how far down the scale you are on evil, If you believe in Jesus, if your trust is in Jesus, it means that your sin has already been judged by God. Do you believe that? Your sin, all of it, past, present, future, if you are a believer and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sin has already been judged by God. So you don't have to fear the final day of judgment. Your sin has already been judged by God. Instead, you can humbly and thankfully and joyfully join with all the other redeemed of heaven who are likewise sinners redeemed by the blood and have exuberant worship in believing that full justice for every sin will be recompensed by God on that final day. 
that he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He will by no means sweep anything under the rug. He is a holy God, and he will recompense every single sin on that final day. So the first point this morning that we get from our text to apply to our lives is triumphant worship anticipates God's recompense. Triumphant worship anticipates that there's a day coming when God will recompense every sin. Most of you know all too well that sin hurts. It not only slanders God, but it damages everything around us, everything horizontally as well. No doubt many of you, even now, even this morning as you sit here, dealing with the pain of others sinning against you. It's real. The call today, listen, instead of you giving in to the carnal tendency to get even against that person or those people who've sinned against you, or to bury it emotionally and live your life as a victim, instead of that, God is calling you to believe that the God who cannot lie will fully recompense every evil done upon the earth, including those done to you. He alone is in that rightful position to execute righteous judgment because not only does he hate sin more than you do, not only is he grieved by sin more than you are, But he knows the thoughts and intentions of every heart behind the sin even before it's committed. And so he alone is able and rightfully the one to judge all sin. That's why Paul says, therefore, in 1 Corinthians 5, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, the righteous one who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. See, that's where sin starts, in our hearts. God knows it all already, and he will bring it into the light so that judgment can be pronounced. What is evil can be burned up, and what is through faith can remain. God goes on through Paul to authoritatively authoritatively command in Romans 12, 19, beloved, never avenge yourself. You're not good enough to judge. I'm not good enough to judge. God alone is never avenge yourselves, but leave it, leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, mine. I own it. I'm the only one capable of executing it. I will Repay, says the Lord. Can you believe that today? Can you find grace to apply that to the the pain that you've suffered from sin? Both your own sin. Some of you beat yourself up day after day over mistakes you've made. Can you release that into God's hands that the holy and righteous judge? Can you surrender any and all harbored hurt, even resentment? that you have sinfully stored up in your heart, every wrong that you've taken into account and revisited day by day, can you release that into God's court of law to adjudicate? Can you find grace to believe that his word applies to your pain and suffering? As you see our world going to hell in a handbasket with injustice on every side, Can you believe that a day is coming when the scales will be righted? (laughs) God wants you to. Because being able to join in the everlasting celebration of his righteous judgment upon sin now, by faith, in advance, is designed to liberate you from your bondage both to your own sin and to the sins that have committed against you. He doesn't want you to live in that straitjacket anymore. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. 
Hallelujah means praise Yah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Yah is short for God's name, Yahweh. And it's an imperative exhortation to praise God that is transliterated into our language. Transliteration is different than translation. Translation is taking a word in a foreign language and giving us the meaning of it. Like in Hebrew, hallelujah means praise God. And so when you read in the Psalms, almost everywhere, especially in the, the 103 through I think 106, everywhere it says praise God in English, in Hebrew it's hallelujah, because what they've done is taken the sounds or the pronunciation of the Hebrew word and just made it into English. We do the same thing with shalom, right? Shalom is a Hebrew word, shalom, but we just make it into an English word, shalom, meaning peace. Same thing with amen, or amen as we say, or amen, whoever, wherever you're from, but Amen and Maranatha, those are all Hebrew words transliterated into English. And so here in our text, the great multitude of heavenly hosts made up of the redeemed of earth already with the Lord, those that are awaiting the resurrection but are with the Lord, are exclaiming hallelujah. They're shouting, hallelujah, not as some mildly indifferent, dull and dry, responsive reading. Like, we got to do this. We're commanded to. No, but as a spontaneous cry of praise and adoration. It's the overflow of a heart filled with the Spirit of God, rejoicing in the justice of God, finally being put on display. Can't hold it back. If you think football stadiums are loud when they're full of fans... Maybe especially if it's like an important game. If you think that the, the clap of thunder when a, a lightning bolt strikes 100 yards away from you is loud, that's nothing compared to this harmonious shout of praise, this ecstatic jubilation these redeemed saints are bringing. Why is that? Why are they? What's behind that? Why are they doing that? Because, like you and I are doing right now, They have been waiting for what seemed to be a long time for God to recompense the debauchery of evil. Not only that they experienced in their lifetimes, but as now part of the host of heaven, that as they look down on the earth and they were in the presence of the Holy One of God, and yet they see his name being cursed, they see his name being drugged through the mud, they see all kinds of strife in the the people on the earth, and they've been waiting For the scales of justice to be balanced. They were desiring not just partial justice like we see in many of our court systems. But full and complete righteous judgment that only God is able or capable of executing. But one portion of this group is especially jubilant. Remember when we read back in Revelation 6 beginning in verse 9. John said, I saw under the altar... The souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They had been faithful unto death, not just because they lived out the course of their life and their body gave in, but because they had been killed they had they'd shed their blood because they refused to recant the gospel when confronted and, and, and challenged to. They said, no, we will die rather than do that. Are you ready to do that? It may be coming in our culture. It's not hyperbole. They had done that. And they've been longing, they've been aching for the day, and now it's fully come. And so in verse 2, they said, His judgments are true and just, for he has judged, he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Back in Edom, all the way, all the way, as I said, back to Sodom and Gomorrah, you see this image of smoke 
smoldering from the ruins, going up as a testament of God's righteous judgment. And their response, they were doing this not only because they were glad, but in response to a command, which is the same thing that God is offering you today, a command to praise him by faith. Back in 18, verse 20, God had commanded, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. So I have a question for you. As you consider the future, not just the future of our world or our country, but your future, how will you respond to a culture that increasingly hates your Savior and Lord and by extension hates you? How are you going to respond? The text is designed to give you courage and assurance that come what may, God promises to bring full recompense down upon their head on that final day. Listen to how Paul exhorts in this same way back in 2 Thessalonians 1.5. Let me just pause and say something here. In America, too much of American Christianity... We just want God to bless us. We just want God to bless us materially, bless us relationally, bless us. We just want his favor. We just, nothing but his face shining on us. But the norm of the Christian life, of standing for Jesus Christ, of being light in the darkness, involves suffering. Every time, it involves suffering. We try to avoid it. We try to, uh, can we take a, is there an alternate route? Let, let me just check my spiritual GPS. Is there a way? No, suffering is normal in the Christian life. Look at Jesus' life. That's the Christian life. Paul says in verse 5, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Since indeed God considers it just, to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord And from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. God will vindicate every single wrong done to his people, for he is the righteous judge. But if in his kindness, God has brought you this morning in the sound of his, into the sound of his word, and you are not yet part of his people, this could be your final warning to repent, the, to renounce having slept with the prostitute of sin and run into the arms of a loving Savior who is even now being patient with you and calling you to see that he loves you so much he died in your place to save you from the judgment that you deserve. I encourage you, if that's you, speak to someone today. Run to Jesus. Well, the celebration of God's justice was not limited to redeemed sinners in this video clip of the coming day. In that same scene, verse 4 says, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Amen, Hallelujah. And so you've got all the redeemed, the saints of God, washed in the blood of the Lord and gone on to be with the Lord and waiting the resurrection. And then you've got the the heavenly host of the, the 24 elders and the four living creatures agreeing with them. They fell down in worship. All of creation, all of creation, except fallen sinners, worships God. That's the core essence of being a part of God's creation is to give him glory. And so they said, amen, hallelujah. Amen, as we mentioned, is another transliterated word. In English, it means let it be so or so be it. Or to put it in simpler terms, maybe that is very true. And so it's quite fitting for you who believe to verbally respond to truth that way. 
whether it's in a sermon or in a song or, or just in a conversation, and you hear God's truth being spoken, to resonate with that truth verbally, to say amen, that's true. That there's something about you verbally articulating an agreement with that that not only pierces the darkness, it not only connects you to the veracity of that truth in a way that being silent cannot, but it also encourages those around you to take to heart, just like you are, the truth of God that's being spoken. Amen. Can we say it together? Amen. One more time. Amen. Thank you. Verse 5. And from the throne, a voice, so this is singular voice, came saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. So you've got a, a great multitude of redeemed sinners, a, 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 a multitude of heavenly hosts. They're all now bowing down to the Lord in heaven. And now an angel from the throne, like a choir master, directs, the saints on earth, to also praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. And so he says, now praise him. Listen to how triumphantly all God's people obeyed that command from the throne. Verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. Remember, all this is a vision John is in a trance, if you will, with God's pure revelation coming to him both in video and in audible means. Then I heard the, what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. John, in another video clip of this same scene, in, a, in another cycle, as I told you, in Revelation 7, he saw this, and there he described this great multitude as so large that no one can number them. Redeem people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language. And here he further describes their cries and essentially says, if you think Niagara Falls is loud, if you think thunder is loud, it, pay, it's, it is deafening, all, imagine all of those decibels being channeled into one harmonious, love-filled shout. To the Lord. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Well, all of this jubilation was not just because perfect justice has been executed, it, it was even more because now their Lord has come to reign over all of his people. Look at verse 7. These are the redeemed of the earth. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for. The marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. You may know that there was a, a wedding here at the church yesterday, and as often the case, the, the family of the bride especially, but I'm sure the groom too, made a lot of preparations, put a lot of work into getting ready for the marriage. But all of our wedding preparations pale in comparison to how the Hebrews conducted a marriage. Their process was far more extensive. First of all, at the first stage, you had the betrothal, which was like an engagement, a formal engagement, but it's far more serious and far more formal than ours. In, in, in our culture, if, if a man and a woman are engaged to be married and, and something happens, uh, it can be easily broken off. Not so in Hebrew culture. They, they were the, once the couple was betrothed, it was just as binding as the consummation of the marriage itself. You remember, we saw that with, with Mary and Joseph, right? They were betrothed to one another, and it was suspected because the Holy Spirit had come on Mary and, and caused her to be pregnant with the Son of God. It was suspected that maybe she had committed immorality, and Joseph, his only choice was either to stay faithful to her or he would have had to get a divorce, and they were only engaged. They were betrothed. William Hendrickson comments about this betrothal. The terms of the marriage are accepted in the presence of witnesses, namely family. And God's blessing is pronounced on their union. From that day forward, the bride and groom are legally married. Child of God, that's what you are right now before the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You are, through your profession of faith, having received the gospel and saying that you believe it and been baptized publicly as a, as a profession of that union, you are formally betrothed to your Savior. You are legally bound in the judgment court of God to Christ. You bear his name. You, he has made you the temple of his own spirit. He has come into you. You are betrothed to Christ, and we're awaiting, which we're going to get to in a couple chapters, the great wedding feast of the Lamb when he not only comes, but we enjoy his presence together, and there is an eternal celebration. Your dowry has already been paid in full by him on the cross. Paid in full. You are joined to Christ by faith. Paul understood that. That's why he said to the Corinthians that were struggling with some sin and disagreements in 2 Corinthians eleven two, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. And so when the bridegroom comes to take us to his home, that's what happened in the Hebrew wedding. After a, a period of time, when the, the, the wedding feast was ready, the bridegroom would come and he would take the bride to be by his side and he would take her to his home, to his home. They didn't go to her home. They went to his home and they dwelled as husband and wife and consummated the marriage. When Jesus comes to take us to his home, there's going to be that great wedding feast and we will be forever one with our Savior as members of his body. We, we want to live like that by faith now that we're already attached to our head and we are his hands and feet. We are his mouth and ears. We are his fingers and toes. We are his body here on earth. But on that day, the great wedding feast of the Lamb, we will share in his glory. Do you believe that? Just as husband and wife are no longer two but one flesh, we will share in the beautiful splendor of Christ himself. There, there will be a communion of glory. He, he said, Jesus prayed this for us in, in John 17. Listen to what he prayed. Remember, he's getting ready to go to the cross, and he's praying to the Father, and he says, Lord, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. <laughs> We don't deserve that in case you weren't noticing. That they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me. That they may become, it's a process, perfectly one. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire also whom I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. If you believe that, that day of our homecoming is, is on its way, that our Savior is coming for his bride, I have another question for you. If you believe that, what are you doing to prepare Remember all these wedding preparations. When the, when the Hebrews were, were preparing for a wedding, it, it was a, a, even a betrothal, but especially the, the, the period in between getting ready for the wedding feast. There was joy and laughter. They were just excited. You can picture it to, to think about that day and how wonderful it was going to be. And our second point of application is that triumphant worship prepares us for the wedding, the period, uh, the, the, the wedding feast of the lamb in Hebrew culture was a seven to ten day event. And our joyful celebration of Jesus in these days of preparation before he comes both unites our hearts to the other members of his body and spurs us on to further acts of service and devotion for his name. Our worship should be experienced as an imperfect foretaste of our consummation. In other words, we want to, as, as we come together in this place or in our small groups or wherever we're worshiping the Lord together, we want to we anticipate that, Lord, this is a foretaste. This is a sampling of the goodness of the worship we will experience forever and ever. Listen again to how the triumphant church exalts Jesus on that day. 
verse 7. Let us rejoice and exult. That's different than exalt. Exalt is just to give him adoration and praise. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her, the gift, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Already, as you believe the gospel, Christ has clothed you with the royal robe of his righteousness. I believe that's why traditionally people wear a, a white robe when they're baptized, just to, to, to just depict visually that God has clothed us with, with his fine wedding garments, if you will. And he's cleansed us from all sin and imputed to us his holiness. He's already come to dwell in us. And his Holy Spirit will increasingly lead us to live holy lives. He is holy. And God, in this process of getting ready for the consummation, of getting ready for the wedding feast of the Lamb, we are increasingly to become holy as he is holy. We call that process sanctification. God is preparing us. And our love and devotion and service to him are a means of, of doing that. But joining by faith in the already not yet celebration of our wedding day spurns still one last desire. And that is that triumphant worship overflows into invitation. It overflows into invitation. The more consistently we enjoy the fullness of God's presence and, and enjoy peace with God through giving him glory and, and, and casting our cares upon him and entrusting all judgment to him. The more we do that, the more we experience the love of God. And the more we experience the love of God, it is designed to flow out of us to others. The more we care about others and want them to know his blessings too. Look at verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this. In other words, this is to be recorded for all posterity. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. To be blessed of the Lord is to enjoy his own happiness in communion with him. It's something the world can't reproduce. Something not available horizontally, it's only available vertically. And the angel declares that all those who are invited, literally called, it, it's a form of the word kaleo. It's, it's all those who are called, all those who are invited to the final stage of the wedding, the great feast that our union with Christ will be consummated, are blessed beyond measure. And so the question is, who's on the guest list? Who's to be invited at first, the good news of this wedding was only being announced to Israel. You remember Jesus in his ministry? He just saying, I've come only for the lost sheep of Israel. They were the only ones on the guest list. But they refused, most of Israel refused to RSVP. They refused to come. They said, we have other plans. And so his disciples, Jesus said, should now, look at Matthew 22, 9. Go therefore, they don't want to come. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast. Go to the promenade. Go to Manassas Mall. Go to Walmart when you're there. Go wherever you go. Go to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, in their own mind. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Invite Everyone you see, that's the guest list. Are they living and breathing? Invite them to follow Jesus. Invite them to give up the prostitute of sin and come and be wed to the pure and holy one, the one who's full of love and goodness and hope for the future. Jesus, when he comes, that parable continues, will see who is by faith in his world properly clothed in the wedding garment in his righteousness who by faith has been imputed the righteousness of God the wedding dress if you will and who has not taken him seriously 
who decided that, you know, there wasn't a real dress code, and so I'm just going to come into the wedding in my sin. Jesus says, king will have him bound and cast into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But that judgment is reserved for the king who knows every thought and intention of the heart, who can see whether someone is regenerate or not. Our job is simply to joyfully invite them to come. Many will scorn us. Many will say we're ignorant and simple. Doesn't matter. We want to indiscriminately invite others who simply declaring the very words of Jesus. You don't have to have an elaborate thing planned out. Just speak the word of God to him. The Holy Spirit is in you so that you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. You can just speak the words of God and he will use his infinitely powerful word to draw his people to himself. Well, John was blown away by the richness of this invitation. Verse 10 Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's tempting, is it not? When you find a preacher that you like or somebody that's more godly than you to kind of see them as a mediator between you and God that almost like in Catholicism they see a priest he says don't do that there's only one mediator between man and God that's the Lord Jesus Christ and he sent his spirit into you so that you're now the priest imperfect as we are we are in union with Jesus he alone deserves triumphant worship And by his Holy Spirit, he's given us power to invite the lost to his wedding feast. That's the plea for each of you today. No amount of sin is beyond the power of Christ's blood to to cleanse you. He's inviting you who've been proud to bow at his feet. He's inviting you who've been lustful to renounce it and bow at his feet. He's inviting you who've been doubting to come, join my bride, partake of my glory, wear my wedding garments. These are the true words of God.